Sapling Bharatiya here and welcome to TFR Newsroom. Today we have with us Ben O'Fury, CEO and co-founder of Commodore. We have been covering Commodore regularly here at TFR, so our audience, you know, they do know about the company. But since we are hosting you for the first time, I want to hear from you. I want to get your perspective. What is Commodore all about? Why you created it? So we actually created it from our own personal pain. So both me and my my partner and other co-founder ETL were developers for many years. I actually worked for Google for many years as a software developer, and my partner had different experience working for big enterprises like eBay and then smaller Israeli startups. And actually, the, the, the pain that both of us felt as being on-call developers, DevOps engineers, basically we're the kind of guys where you, 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 we used to get the alert at 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. And what we realized is that even though we have all of those monitoring tools in place and log solutions, et cetera, given an alert, Usually the first thing that comes to your mind is, wait, what the heck changed? Because five minutes ago, everything was great, but you need to get this immediate context of what changed, what happened in the system, so you can trace the root cause and you can understand how to fix it. And unfortunately, you know, the monitoring and logging tools are not meant for this use case. So they're doing a great job in you know, monitoring your system or you know, providing you a management for all of your logs. But when you have an alert, specifically in Kubernetes, which is a very uh, defrag and distributed and complex system, basically what you really want is some place to understand the different relation between all of the different components that can go wrong, and then someone that can tell you what are the components that are currently faulty, and out of all of those noise, what is the most important or most relevant to the specific alert you're trying to troubleshoot. And this pain uh, was so hard for us that both of us actually, orthogonal, uh, developed internal tools for our companies to mitigate this pain. And once we talked about it in some uh, random uh, coffee shop a few, basically almost two years ago, we realized that, you know, this pain is shared across different teams, different companies, and it might make sense that it will be, you know, a generic or a platform that can solve it instead of uh, miserable developers like us trying to develop in, in-house uh, tooling to solve this pain. If you look at the whole, you know, observability space, uh, monitoring, logging, uh, as you were saying, you know, that uh, they are good tools, you know, existing one, they tell you there's something there, but you need to take an action also, right? That's what you said, your team was there to fix it. So how, what kind of evolution do you see in the whole metrics, monitoring, logging, observability space, so that we are also talking about understandability and actionability? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. So one thing I can say about observability and monitoring tools is it's mandatory, everyone understands their impact. And I can say that it's almost, almost a commodity these days. So you have great solutions, either open source tools, right? Like Grafana, Prometheus, et cetera. Or of course, managed solution, you know, I don't want to name drop, but you can all guess, you know, which tools are dominating the category. And those are providing great value for the users. In fact, before them, you know, the users, the customers of those users was the one to complain when there is an issue. Now instead of this, at least they're getting an alert that there's some degradation and they need to check it. So their value is tremendous. But what we know, what we see, what we experience firsthand is that in average uh, organization, they have hundreds or thousands of alerts, right? Now they need to drop everything else every time there is an alert and to do something in the world, to query different tools, to correlate information from different systems, to basically become an expert in Kubernetes or different, different environment just to understand what changed, what's the root cause of each one of those alerts. And then of course they need to take actions. Sometimes those actions uh, will solve the issue, right? Sometimes you do a rollback and it solves the issue. Sometimes the action is more soft. Maybe it will increase the memory and you hope it won't recur again in the system, right? Maybe you do a restart for some machine and you hope that this will solve the problem. Maybe it was transient issue. So we also need to take a lot of actions, but this as well requires a lot of understanding of expertise. You obviously don't want to take an action that will that will might de- uh, degrade the, the symptoms and the issue instead of solving it. So basically, what we see is that monitoring and logging are mandatory, are a huge piece of troubleshooting, but they are definitely not enough. And when we think about troubleshooting, we always think about you know those three pillars: uh, understand, manage, prevent. Meaning, when you have an issue, when you have an alert. You need to understand really well what's going on, you know, what happened recently in the system, the different context, the business logic and the Kubernetes or infrastructure logic combined. 
Then you need to manage the issue, right? Like taking action, maybe communicate with your team members, maybe do a revert or rollback, et cetera. And then you need to make sure it won't reoccur in the system, meaning you need to prevent similar issues to reoccur uh, in your system again. And what we see is currently those three things are being handled by three, five, seven different tools and different team members. And it's very, very uh, inefficient and takes a lot of time and resources from the organization. If you look at a troubleshooting perspective, how much role does culture or, you know, we talk about chaos engineering, you know, where you do bring the teams, you throw things at them. I mean, it's not really that chaotic, it's very planned, but does that also play any role there when it comes to troubleshooting so that your teams are actually prepared that, hey, this might go wrong and this is how you handle it? I think chaos troubleshooting, first of all, it's it's a novel approach and it's super interesting and super interesting to see if it's it, if it will become the standard of or not. I will even take maybe a simpler concept, right? Tests, right? Test, you know, ideally will solve all of your issues, right? You should just test it. Uh, but we all know that, you know, there is limitation. So we need to have, you know, end-to-end -end tests and integration tests and different layers of tests. The way I see chaos engineering is maybe like the next layer of test, right? So some things you can't check in staging or canary, so you must use production, right? But even though, even though you had more layers, it's like in security, you will still have issues. Maybe the issues it will have will be more severe. Maybe it will be a bit more rare. But the way I see it, if you feel more confident because you have less issues, you're going to move faster. And once you're going to move faster, you're going to make more changes. Once you're going to make more changes, you're going to have more issues in your production. So it's, it's like an ever-ending loop of moving faster, having more issues in production, fixing them faster. I, want, I don't think that it will ever end by a system that don't have any issues. Because if I'm the VP R&D, and if I'm saying to my developers, look, it seems that our system is too stable, it probably means they're not moving that fast. Uh, I just read the report of Google, you know, they released once a year, uh, a DevOps report about the ecosystem, et cetera. And from their report, the most sophisticated, they call it, I think, platinum group of DevOps and, uh, you know, the best developers, the best organizations, between five to 10% of all of their changes lead to issues. Meaning, you know, they push 1,000 changes, they know that, you know, five of them will have some bug and they take it into consideration. It's okay. It's part of the drill, right? It's part of the ecosystem we live in. Uh, so if you ask me, issues will always be a problem. Uh, alerts and incidents will always be something that developers and DevOps and SRE will need to handle. And we have to equip them with the right tools and expertise to do that. Right. And that brings me to my next question, which is also the theme of today's discussion is that, as you were alluded to earlier, that cloud native, especially Kubernetes, things get complicated very quickly. It's, it's, it is a complicated you know, word there. And, and automation plays a very big role there. So if we just look at troubleshooting, you folks are announcing you know, a workflow to automate troubleshooting. Uh, you did talk about it a bit, so uh, I can see it. But if I ask you, what was the driver behind this announcement? And then we'll talk about what it is and how it works. Sure. So as we probably all know, Kubernetes uh, is a very complex and distributed system, right? So, you know, people tend to think about Kubernetes as maybe like one thing. But in fact, you know, it has thousands of different pieces, right? So, you know, it has pods and nodes and services and clusters and load balancer and jobs and, and you know, and ingress and CRDs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those components relate to each other in one way or another, right? For, for example, between pods and nodes, there is many to many uh, relation. So when you have an issue in a pod, an observability might not be enough because you will see that, you know, the pod is uh, having uh, not enough replicas available, great. But why? Is it a node issue? For example, are, are all of the pods that running on the same node having the same issue? So it might be a node issue, right? But how can you check it easily? Or maybe maybe it's a prober issue, right? Maybe someone just changed the configuration of the prober of the node of the pod, and this is why your, your pod is having some issues. So when you have an issue, you need to examine so many different components, and you need to have so many expertise and knowledge about how Kubernetes operate that just giving a way to observe or a visibility upon all of those resources might not be enough for most organizations. So once we saw how much of expertise and, and, and experience is lacking for our R&D organizations, we figured out that a very good product or a very good solution will have to provide them not only a way to observe the, sta the status of the different Kubernetes resources, but also to allow them basically a single place 
uh, to conduct very comprehensive and complex uh, queries and checks on top of Kubernetes that currently they are lacking the knowledge how to do that. So what they're doing usually is they, they are forced to escalate to the head of DevOps or to the senior R&D team member who knows how to do those checks, who knows how to do those queries on the different components and how to correlate this information. But what we want to do is basically to democratize uh, this knowledge that currently is very, very, very sparse in every organization. Uh, so we do that basically by taking all of this information we have and taking all of this you know, knowledge and expertise that our customers are having and basically are offering uh, a workflow that already has baked in all of the expertise and knowledge we have about Kubernetes troubleshooting in an automated way. So once an on-call developer, a very newbie developer that has no idea how to do those things, once he gets the alert, Commodore is already running 20 different checks on this specific alert and figuring out what happened. So he won't even need to explore different uh, tabs or different tools. Can you talk about what is change intelligence? Everybody defines it in their own way. How would you define it? And how much role does it play at Commodore? Once we started, we, we you know, a year ago, a year and a half ago, we saw the role that has, you know, metrics and has logs. But what was really missing is changes, right? And I think it makes sense that it was missing because if we think about it like five or 10 years ago, you know, a company used to do a release once a quarter. Okay, so it's not that hard to track, you know, a quarterly releases, right? Like, you know, it's February, so nothing happened lately, right? But, you know, since company moved to a CACD model and started to really move fast with all of the microservices and Kubernetes, et cetera, they started to make much more changes. And when I say changes, it can be code changes, it can be configuration changes, it can be infrastructure changes, it can be DB changes, it can be feature flags that change. And unfortunately, it's all of the above, right? So you have a mix of all of those changes. And the interesting thing about changes is that in 85% of the cases, they are responsible or they are in, indeed the root cause for issues or for incidents in modern organizations. So, you know, on one hand, you have tons of changes. You know that, you know, this is probably the root cause or this is have a lot to do with the root cause of most of, of your issues. But on the other hand, keeping track and having visibility with all of those changes is almost mission impossible just using, for example, a log solution, right? Like you open, you open your ELK solution and you have three terabytes of logs. Now, good luck understanding, you know, what really changed in which component and what to do with all of this information. So in our opinion, change intelligence is not only keeping track of all of the changes, is how can you make something smart out of it, right? How can you take a change in AWS that affected the security group and trace it back to on which machines it affected and then to understand what are the Kubernetes pods that use those machines and then track it back to some deployment that just happened and then to understand that this is why Jenkins job failed, right? So taking those changes from those different, different pieces of, of, of tools and components and correlating together to conduct a coherent story, this is what we call change intelligence, right? This capability, this notion. And the way we see it, without change intelligence, you're going to lose the battle, right? You're going to chase 10 different tools every time. You're going to have you know, your uncle developer, your DevOps engineer constantly firefighting instead of basically innovating and developing when this is what you want them to do. You were also initially talking about uh, the complexity of Kubernetes and how tools are evolving. So if I ask you, what kind of trends are you seeing? I mean, Kubernetes is a huge space, so I'm not talking the trends in general, but especially in this, you know, troubleshooting monitoring space. Yeah. So I think two tools or two trends that we're seeing is you no know, one vast adoption of Kubernetes in also like enterprises company and big big companies that until now you know stood on the fence and tried to see where it's going. I think now it's safe to say that, you know, Kubernetes is enterprise ready in terms of security, scale, et cetera, and adoption. So we see obviously vast majority of Kubernetes adoption. With this, with the Kubernetes adoption, we see a very, you know, significant trend of adapting Kubernetes native tools. So we probably heard about Algo CD, where like two years ago, you know, we, we explored Algo CD. It was like a small project that, you know, only a few people knew about. Now we see many customers adapting Algo CD in order to make you know, Kubernetes native deployments. So you know, Kubernetes not only bring you know, itself, but also a new set of tools that are Kubernetes native. 
So of course, we also see a very high adoption of Prometheus, which is not only for Kubernetes, but has a very good you know, built-in uh, support for microservices and, and Kubernetes uh, specifically. So we definitely see you know, now companies trying to find tools that are native to Kubernetes. I think this is where Commodore obviously fits in very nicely in this trend. I think our organizations understand that Kubernetes is not only a Docker orchestration. It's not a trend that is going to pass. It's basically the operating system for most of their cloud operations. And you can see how you know the security guys, the DevOps, the developers, the SRE, the NOC, all of them are aligned that Kubernetes is going to be the heart and the different tools, the monitoring, the management, et cetera, needs to integrate with Kubernetes. And obviously, you know, to do that, it's not an easy challenge. And you know, this is where tools like Commodore or other tools can fit in and provide a lot of value for those organizations. Ben, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about not only these trends, uh, the whole evolution of observability, but also uh, workflow. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.